Autumn Run, A Robo Dragon Story. Story by Gabe Regal. Art by Gabe Regal and Dolly. Where are you going this time, Dada? Halvir asked. He was big for a young dragon, almost half again the size of most dragons his age. He was so big, in fact, that his father Bjarn had trouble lifting him, even with the immense strength his Draco servos gave him. But he didn't let that stop him as he hoisted Halvir up onto his armored back. Well, son, he began in his usual smiling way. The village is running low on robot oil, and I'm the only robot dragon with enough storage tanks big enough to get the oil we need to get us to the winter. I see, replied Halvar. It wasn't unusual for his dada to leave from time to time on some errand or another, but this time felt different. Where does the robot oil come from? Bjorn sighed softly and started moving towards the cave entrance. A long way from here, son across the desert of days to the shores of the Sea of Souls. That is a long way, Halvir agreed, sliding down Bjorn's back and off of his gently twitching tail. He was about to ask another question when a smaller voice yelled, Dada! Halvir's sister Hedda came charging through the cave entrance, the little steam pistons at her legs puffing with effort, and slammed into Bjorn's chest plate. He picked her up, laughing all the while, and swung her around by her segmented arms. Hey there, little one. Where is your mama? She's in the garden. I was helping her. Hedda lifted her head proudly as Bjorn set her down. Well, then we'd better go see her. Bjorn strode to the cave entrance and out into the bright autumn sunlight. It was the beginning of the time when the colors of the forest changed from brilliant greens and blues to dark reds and oranges and other less definable tones. Bjorn's wife, Britta, was working in their vegetable garden, softly humming to herself in the sylvan stillness. The boisterous sounds of Hedda and Halvir caused her to look up from her work. Off so soon, she smiled wistfully, wiping the dirt from her claws. Bjorn closed the distance between them and nuzzled her with his long snout. Yes, my love, off again, but home again soon enough. Be safe, she admonished. Always, he replied, smiling as he stepped back. Now where are my two little dragons? Hedda and Halvir squealed with delight as he scooped them both up into his arms. Take care of your mama, little ones. I love you. I'll be back before you know it. Chapter 2. Into the Wastes The mountain pass that Bjorn now followed was narrow and steep. It had been two days since he waved goodbye to his family and one since he had seen the last of his lush forest home. Now the world was drab and gray. Humongous shards of rock towered over him like fingers pointed up at the sky. Up ahead, he could see the summit, glowing with the last vestiges of light from the evening sun. It would be dark soon. He crested the summit just as the sun dipped below the far horizon. The, the desert of days spread out before him. He found a comfortable-looking rock and sat, resting his pistons and servos for the journey ahead. Soon, stars began to blink into view into, in the darkening night sky. Bjorn closed his eyes and waited for night to fall. An hour later, he opened his eyes and began to search the sky. Within moments, he found what he was looking for. A pale green star, shining brighter than all the others around it. The Eye of the Dragon. Several other stars shimmered in its vicinity, forming a hazy but recognizable outline of a dragon. The constellation of Draconis Major. With a grunt, Bjorn slid off the stone and trudged into the desert. The Eye of the Dragon in his view. It was only when the sky began to lighten that he slowed his pace. There was no shade to speak of in the desert, so he stopped where he was, fixed his surroundings, and closed his eye shutters. Chapter 3. The Zgarabi Bjarn awoke when the sun was still high in the sky. A strange buzzing noise filled the air. He looked around and noticed a small collection of large, flat stones piled haphazardly a few meters away. The buzzing seemed to be coming from them. He rose and stomped over to investigate. The stones lay on top of a large crack in the dry, sandy earth. Wedged in between the two sides of the crack, just a little ways from the top, was a creature Bjorn had never seen. It was small, about the size of his foot. A bright yellow ceramic shell covered its dorsal surface, contrasted by strange black markings. Six insect-like legs sprouted from its body. A large blue eye blinked rapidly as it tried and failed to free itself from the crack. The buzzing sound Bjorn had heard emanated from a small speaker grill on the underside of its head. Bjorn immediately stooped down to pry the creature out of its predicament. 
It came free in moments and squirmed in his hands until he set it down. There you are, friend, he smiled as the diminutive creature scuttled up onto a nearby rock. All better now? The creature, who did not appear to have a head to nod, merely tilted his body at a slight angle and swiveled its glowing eye in his direction. Do you have a name, friend? Pjarn asked. The creature righted itself and performed the same action as before. Moments later, though, a tiny voice squeaked out from the speaker. Zzz, I am Zirkaz of Zizkarabi. Bjorn smiled again and introduced himself. It's a pleasure to meet you, Zirkaz. I don't suppose you know of any place I could find some shade around here until the sun goes down. Zzz, Zirkaz buzzed and thought. The Ark of Zizgarabi will give you shelter. Without another word, Zirkaz hopped off of the rock and scuttled off towards another cluster of rocks that Bjorn hadn't noticed before. Bjorn followed, amused and grateful for the coming respite from the desert heat. The Ark, it turned out, was an abandoned spaceship, sunk deep into the desert sands. The other Zgarabi welcomed Bjorn with a polite buzzing and gave him a place to rest until nightfall. When nightfall came, he thanked his hosts and made his way back out into the desert to find Dracon's Major. After fixing the constellation with his eyes, he started off again over the gently undulating sands. Chapter 4 The Sea of Souls The sun was just beginning to rise as he tromped the last few meters up the side of a large sand dune. From the top, he could see the rocky shore of the Sea of Souls. He wasn't quite sure why it was named the Sea of Souls, or who had given it that menacing moniker, but it looked pleasant enough in the wild morning light. The robo-oil production facility was located on an island in the bay. Without pretense, he waded into the rolling surf. Since he was a robot dragon, he didn't need to breathe, per se. His considerable bulk caused him to sink to the bottom whenever he was in a body of water. That being the case, he simply tramped on into the waves. As the water closed over his head, he activated his eye beams to better see in the sand-filled murk of the inlet. Before long, the water cleared and he made his way easily along the rock-strewn bottom. He had only covered half the distance to the facility when a long, thin shape flashed in front of his eye beams. His head whipped around, trying to track the shape, but it was gone before he could fix it. Another shape flashed in front of him, and from somewhere behind him he heard a giggle. Oh no, he thought. Not these guys again. The long, thin form of a sea snake appeared in front of him, and Bjorn groaned. The sea snakes of the Sea of Souls were notoriously silly. What do you call an acorn that lacks the buzz? The sea snake asked in a slightly manic tone of voice. Wait, wait, I know this one. Another sea snake, long and purple with cerulean rings, wrapped itself around Bjorn's arm. A beacorn! It stared at him for a moment with bright yellow eyes, then burst out laughing. The other snake curled itself into knots, whooping with laughter, and a third sounded from somewhere nearby. All right, fellas, you've had your laugh, Bjorn said as he attempted to pry the second sea snake off his arms. Let me be about my business, please. Business? The third snake asked, hovering to view. Business? The snake on his arm uncurled itself and swam a short ways off, muttering to itself. Business, business. Yes, yes. Before you go, though, you must guess. Guess what? Bjorn asked cautiously. What? All three snakes replied simultaneously. Bjorn looked at them in confusion for a moment before he realized the whole thing had been the setup for a joke. Oh, for the love. He grumbled and pushed his way past them. The sea snakes devolved into a writhing mass of purple and cerulean, howling with laughter. Bjorn was almost to the island by the time their laughter faded out completely. The robo-oil production facility was entirely automated. When he arrived, Bjorn hooked up his storage tanks to the oil dispensers and filled them up. His return trip to the Sea of Souls was blissfully free of sea snakes. Chapter 5 Journey's End If the return trip to the Sea of Souls was uneventful, the return trip to the Desert of Days was downright mind-numbing. Bjorn still traveled by night, guided this time by a different constellation, the cup-shaped formation known as the Little Sipper. Its collection of winking stars led him to the foot of the great mountains that ring the forested valley he called home. The sun was rising, but he was tired from his journey across the shifting sands. He sat down in the shadow of a large stone, rested his head against it, and fell asleep. Moments later, he was awoken by the sound of stone crashing against stone, 
He barely had time to move before a violent earthquake sent the large stone behind him hurtling to the ground. In his haste to avoid the stone, he tripped on a much smaller stone and fell backwards. His arms, legs, and tail flailed about, searching for a grip. It was not to be found, though. Bjorn hit the ground hard enough to jar his vision. The earthquake quieted it, and as the dust settled, he realized he had fallen into a natural cavern. It was large and rounded, like someone had blown up a giant tire inside of a mountain, then let all the air out. A shaft of light poured down through the large hole in the cave ceiling. It was only then that Bjorn noticed that he was not the cave's only occupant. A gigantic rock golem loomed out of the shadows. It was the color of basalt and rust, and twice as tall as Bjorn. It had large, segmented arms, a barrel chest, and hands that looked like they could crush stone itself. Its head was a featureless mask of solid rock. The most unnerving thing, however, was that it made so no sound at all. In fact, Bjorn thought, it looked frozen. Or dead? Just to be sure, Bjorn moved slowly and carefully out of the golem's reach before addressing it in his most polite tone of voice. Hello there, friend, Bjorn gulped nervously. I don't suppose you could point me to the nearest exit. A few moments passed. Bjorn decided to try again. I hope you'll pardon my persistence, he began. Suddenly a low moan issued forth from the depths of the golem. Bjorn jumped in surprise. Can you talk, friend? The golem moaned again, softly. Perhaps you can show me instead, Bjorn persisted. The golem merely moaned louder. Bjorn could not understand why the golem didn't just point the way. Even if it was unable to speak, surely it could point. Then another realization hit him. The golem hadn't moved the entire time they'd been interacting. You must be frozen, Bjorn said, thinking out loud. The golem replied with a high-pitched squeal. That's it, isn't it? Another squeal confirmed his suspicions. Moving carefully, he approached the golem and extended the servicing hose from his forearm. Slowly, he began to oil all of the golem's various joints. In moments, he was finished. As he stood back to inspect his work, the golem began to move. At first, all Bjorn could hear were a few ticks and creaks. Then, with a low screeching sound, the golem stood straight. It began to roll its arms around slowly, flexing its fingers experimentally as it did. Then it took a step. Then another. Before he could react, the golem scooped up Bjorn in his arms and leapt for the hole in the cave ceiling. It landed with a thunderous crash on the hard slate of the ground above and set Bjorn down. Then, with a gentle nod of its massive head, it turned and strode off into the desert. Bjorn watched it go for a while, then set out to find the trail home. Epilogue Halvir and Hedda were out searching for glowing mushrooms when they heard the crunch of pine needles in the distance. That brought their heads up. Another crunch and the wind of Bjorn's servos had them running. Bjorn appeared from behind the stand of trees and was instantly tackled by his two children. Dada, you're home! The children yelled in tandem. Bjorn laughed and hugged them tightly to his chest. My sweet baby dragons, I missed you so much. Britta appeared behind the children with a basket on her arm. We missed you too. Mama, Dada's home! Hedda exclaimed loudly. Yes, she agreed, and now we're together again.